I would like to ask you, if I say you the term awakening, what is the meaning for you? What appears in your mind about the term awakening? Yeah, well, let's see. I think the first thing to acknowledge is that uh, the term is used in a lot of different ways. But in general, as my understanding is it seems to refer to a family of states of consciousness that are characterized by certain things. One list of characteristics would be the classic descriptions of mystical experience from William James. But those and those characteristics can include things like a sense of transpersonal identity, a sense of uh, a larger, more profound scope of awareness, depth of awareness. I find the term rather problematic because it doesn't it doesn't clearly differentiate enough things. For example, I mentioned it's often referred to as a state, but awakening can also be used to refer to an enduring trait, uh, not just a, a peak experience, or as Maslow called it, or even a plateau experience, but an enduring way of being. One way in which the term awakening is not so, not as precise as it might be. But as it's often referred to, awakening has been goal or aspiration of the great contemplative traditions associated with the world religions. And Yet, even within states, there are clearly uh, families of different states and different traditions we now know clearly aim for different states. Whereas at one stage, there was the idea that of the so-called transcendental unity of religions, that all the mystical sides of, of the, all the great religions and the contemplative practices aim to open effectively the same realization of state of consciousness. I think we now need to differentiate that more and recognize that different families of traditions and different practices aim to and are inclined to cultivate somewhat different states. For example, the shamanic states, form states, that is, there is imagery associated with them. There's a sense of activity, a separate, still a separate self-sense. That's one family of states. If you think of, for example, Christian mystic mystical experience, in which awakening is not so much a Christian term, but there is an awakening to perhaps uh, an experience of the divine or perhaps experiences of archetypal spiritual figures or to visions of Jesus. You know, there's a lot of different experiences. So, so even within a single tradition, there's a very wide family of experiences that practices can point to. Within Buddhism, for example, each of the major divisions of Buddhism seems to have a somewhat different view of awakening. The Theravadan tradition aims for what's called cessation. All form drops away. There is an experience of formless awareness, we could say. The Mahayana tradition, Zen, seems to emphasize more a recognition of, of prajna, of uh, transconceptual awareness. Vajrayana aims for a whole variety of of experiences and states, including its conception of nirvana as not as uh, an experience of the absolute, but as rather samsara seen through the lens of the recognition of awareness. We could go on and on, but I think one of the most important things is that awareness, as it's usually used, is a very loose term. It can refer not just to one family of experiences, but to whole multiple families of experiences of, of altered states. And it can also point to the distinction between a transient state experience or peak experience on the one hand, an enduring trait experience is where the state becomes a, a way of being that endures throughout experiences. Classic example would be Sahaj Samadhi, in which there is a continual non-dual awareness that persists throughout all experiences. And we haven't even talked about uh, the nighttime awakening experiences of dream yoga, for example. Probably that's enough. I've probably said enough. Yes. And uh, now I would like to challenge you with uh, your personal experience about awakening. If you should say the most important experience of awakening in your life. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not 
sure I'm inclined to talk so much about personal experience. I think, you know, as one does contemplative practice, and I've been doing fairly intensive contemplative practice now for 40 years. I just uh, a month ago got out of a two-month meditation retreat. I think there's just a wide array of experiences and states of consciousness, and they just seem to be boundless. And hopefully each insight or opening provides a, another perspective, another a little insight, another understanding, and hopefully they're cumulative, and hopefully they become part of one's one's personality and way of being. The goal is not just different experiences. The goal is transformation, maturation, purification, action in the world as in increasingly compassionate, effective, skillful, wise ways. Okay. And uh, if you would say something as a sort of suggestion or invitation to young people about uh, part of awakening, what would you say to them? I would say one of the most important recognitions of life is that we are not who we usually assume ourselves to be. We are, some, we are something that is far grander and greater. We have depths of our being and levels of awareness and possibilities and potentials and capacities far beyond our conventional understanding, and that there are practices for opening us to those recognitions, and that the world's great religions contain technology of transcendence and art and science for developing the same, same states of consciousness, insights, realizations, and ways of being that the great religious founders discovered. And that we too, we can both wake up, uh, that is, have these older states, but we can also grow up. And that one of the great contributions of contemporary developmental psychology is the recognition that what we took to be normality is not the ceiling of our potentials, that there are further post conventional stages of development that are available to us. So we can mature in multiple ways. We can open to transpersonal states of consciousness, we can mature psychologically, we can foster maturation, we can cultivate purification, that is the reduction of painful, destructive emotions and motives, and foster positive motives and emotions like love and joy and empathy and altruism and compassion and care. It is possible to really develop ourselves far beyond what we thought was possible. And this potential is available to us all, and it's one of the most fulfilling things we can do. And it's also one of the ways we can most effectively contribute and serve in the world, because we are the instrument of healing. And truly, if we look at the world at, at the present moment, we see all the major threats and challenges we face are for the first time in history human caused. And that means they are the expression of our individual and collective behavior. And in fact, they're the expressions of our individual and collective states of mind. So what we call our global problems are actually global symptoms. They're symptoms of our individual and collective psychological and spiritual immaturity and dysfunctions. And we can grow beyond those. We have the tools and practices. All the qualities of heart and mind that we most deeply aspire to can be cultivated. And that's the great gift of the world's contemplative traditions and now of contemporary, uh, some forms of contemporary psychology and psychotherapy. This is uh, Dr. Professor Roger Walsh for uh, the Transpersonal Legacy Panel of Eurotas Conference 2023. Maybe you can say something to our audience will be, I guess, uh, much people well, listening to you. Yeah, how wonderful that you're all gathering. I'm wishing I could be there. What a, what a beautiful opportunity to be with hundreds of fellow transpersonal explorers. The gift of community like this is priceless, and I'm so happy you're all gathering and enjoying each other, and I hope you just have a wonderful time and are inspired to continue your inner work and work in the world as well. And thank you so much for all the work you're doing. It's uh, just beautiful that you're doing this, Pierre. Uh, just a gift to us all.